Nobody knows technology more than I do. Nobody knows the system more than I do. Nobody knows money better than me. Nobody is stronger than me. Nobody is better to people with disabilities than me. There is no one who's done so much for equality as I have. Nobody is bigger or better at the military than me. Nobody is fighting for the veterans like I am fighting for the veterans. The sale of uranium, nobody knows what it means. I know what it means. I know more about drones than anybody. I know more about ISIS than the generals do. Believe me. Nobody knows more about trade than me. No one in the history of this country has known um, as much about infrastructure than me. I know the H1B, I know the H2B, nobody knows it better than me. Nobody knows politicians better than I do. Nobody knows taxes better than I do. And nobody knows more about debt than I do. Nobody knows more about construction than I do. Nobody knows more about campaign finance than I do. I understand things. I comprehend very well, okay? Better than, I think, almost anybody. Nobody builds walls better than me. Nobody knows more about environmental impact statements than me. I know about more about the environment than most people. I know a lot about wind. I know windmills very much. I've studied it better than anybody. I know more about renewables than any human being on the earth. I know more about golf than Obama knows. I know more about steel workers than anyone who's ever run for office. In the case of Turkey and the Kurds, I could go into a whole story because I understand it better, I think, than anybody. Nobody knows more about banks than I do. I know more about offence and defence than they will ever understand. Uh, who knows more about lawsuits than I do? I'm the king. There is nobody who respects women more than I do. Nobody loves the Bible more than I do. The truth is, I'm actually a very modest person. Very modest. It's true. Do you know who it is that I've been quoting? I've just given you 38 genuine quotes from the one person. Can you guess who it is? Well, it's none other than the 45th President of the United States, Donald Trump. I think we're on safe ground when we say that Donald Trump is filled with pride. He was elected on a platform where he promised to make America great again, but the greatest of them all, it seems, is the man himself, if, if those 38 quotes are anything to go by. Maybe he has a point. Maybe if you do want to get somewhere in life, and he certainly has gotten somewhere in life, he's the most powerful politician in the world. If you want to get somewhere in life, maybe a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of pride, maybe that's necessary. As Donald Trump himself has said, show me someone without an ego and I'll show you a loser. Well, Jesus of Nazareth not only suggests a different path, he insists upon it. When we read the words of Jesus, we read words which say to us that pride must be cut out of the Christian life just like we might cut out a cancer from the body. What we read in today's passage are three home truths that teach us that things like ego, selfish ambition, arrogance, pride, they've all got to go and they need to be replaced by a completely different ambition. The first truth isn't actually about us. It's about Jesus and the path that he would lead us upon. And so we pick up Mark uh, in chapter 10, starting at verse 32, where we read these words. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. 
Three days later, he will rise. This is the third time in Mark's Gospel that we hear Jesus explaining what's in store for him at the end of his ministry. The suffering, death and resurrection of Jesus, these were not an accident. It was in the plan all along. Now, why was this suffering in the plan? Well, we'll hear why as this passage unfolds. But for the time being, we're reminded of our first home truth. The path that Jesus walked was the path of a humble and sacrificial servant. And this was news that was hard for the disciples to accept. You may remember last time Peter heard these words, he issued a rebuke to Jesus saying, no, 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 that's not the way it's going to work. But now it seems like the reality might finally, ever so slowly, be sinking in. Take note of how Mark explains the emotions that were being felt by those people who were following along in Jesus' train at this point in time. Mark describes how Jesus is leading the way to Jerusalem and the disciples were astonished at what was happening. They were astonished that Jesus was walking headlong into Jerusalem, into this, into this hornet's nest. Others, Mark tells us, were afraid. They're starting to realise that following Jesus will be costly. They're starting to realise that the path set down for the Master is also a path for the disciple. I wonder whether we are clear on the nature of this path. Does the path of humble service fit with what we expect of our Christian faith? Martin Luther, the, the German theologian of the 1500s, he drew a distinction between what on one hand he called the the theology of the cross and what on the other he called the theology of glory. Two different ways of thinking about God and thinking about what's expected of us. The theology of the cross and the theology of glory. The theology of the cross takes as its starting point the suffering that Jesus speaks about here in Mark chapter 10. It teaches us that in Jesus we see God as a servant. It teaches us that our salvation is achieved not by what we do, but by what is achieved for us, on our behalf, at the cross. And it's a theology which teaches us that we follow along behind with works of service. That's the theology of the cross. The theology of glory, on the other hand, is about winning. We achieve salvation through our own strength. We expect lives of glory and power. And Luther taught that the Bible really only speaks about one theology, and that's the theology of the cross. Now, there are many churches who, it seems to me, their teaching is shaded somewhat by the theology of glory. Some churches might teach that we can indeed do something to earn salvation through our own good works. There might be other churches which teach their, their congregational members to expect lives of power, uh, lives of great blessing. Now, it's true, there are many blessings for those who place their trust in Jesus. But if we remember our passage from, from last week, uh, Jesus does promise us blessings, but along with them, he also promises persecutions. He promises a cross-shaped path for us. It's the theology of the cross that we see in the Bible, the theology of the cross that Jesus lived by, and it's the theology of the cross that Jesus commands his followers to take up. But the second home truth that we find here in Mark chapter 10 is that it's human nature to reach for a theology of glory. That's what we really want. We, we want to be glorious. Uh, from verse 35. Then James and, and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. It reminds me of what a child might ask of a parent. Mum, Dad, I'm going to ask you something and I want you to say yes. 
The immaturity of the statement here is a little bit of a sign of, of what's about to come in the rest of the passage. But notice Jesus' response. Uh, he doesn't agree to, to give them whatever it is they ask, but nor does he rebuke them. Like you would expect of a patient parent. Uh, he's dealing very lovingly with, with these two. Uh, verse 36. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. It's a request that demonstrates the kind of fuzzy vision that we've come to expect of the disciples. They're starting to understand what it is that Jesus has been saying. That there will be a point where Jesus will be shrouded in glory. They've seen a little glimpse of that with the transfiguration, if you remember. And this is a glory that will be shared with his followers. But James and John want to have the best of that glory for themselves. Jesus hints at what's missing from their sense of perception in, in verse 38. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? Once more, here in verse 38, Jesus speaks about the cross. Although he does speak about it in somewhat veiled terms. In the Old Testament, the, the image of drinking from the cup was an image describing God's anger and punishment in regard to human sin. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15, God instructs his prophet Jeremiah to take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. Uh, it seems that the image of baptism is also used here as a reference to God's judgment. It, oftentimes in, in the Bible, the, the image of being overwhelmed with water, which is kind of what you see when people are being baptised, they're, you know, they're overwhelmed with water if they're kind of dunked in a river. Um, this image of being overwhelmed was often used to describe God's anger with sin or God's punishment for sin. Think of Noah and the flood in the book of Genesis. Jesus is giving us a clue here as to why it is he had to follow the path of the cross. The cross was the place where he endured the punishment for human sin. The cross was the place where Jesus endured a punishment on our behalf. The punishment for our sins. Yes, Jesus was headed for a glorious future. But that glory would only be found by way of the cross. We get a short, sharp response from James and John. Uh, they say, we can. Like, like Peter will say in chapter 14, uh, when Peter says, even if all fall away, I never will. Uh, what we see here from James and John is, is a, a, a real sure sense that they can follow Jesus all the way. Uh, it's a confidence which is yet to be tested in the crucible that will be Jerusalem in that final week of Jesus ministry but Jesus says to them well you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant these places belong to those for whom they have been prepared it's a little bit of prophecy that we have from Jesus here now, looking into the future and he tells James and John that they will follow this path that Jesus is walking. And James himself will suffer the ultimate price for following Jesus. He'll be killed. And we read about that in Acts chapter 12. And John will end his days on exile on the island of Patmos. And both these men suffering because of their commitment to Jesus. They ask for glory... But what they receive is an invitation to live a, sac a sacrificial life. Um, so it is with anyone who would follow Jesus. And it doesn't seem that they were alone in their desire for grandeur. When the ten heard about this, Mark tells us in verse 41, they became indignant with James and John. It's interesting to wonder why it is that the rest of the disciples became indignant. Is it because they were deeply disappointed with this immature attitude from two of their brethren? Is that the reason? Or are they a little bit miffed that they were pipped at the post? 
that James and John decided to run ahead of them and get what it was that they were really hoping for. I, I think actually it's the second of those two interpretations. I, I think this is a little sign that the rest of the disciples were hoping themselves to be great one day. Uh, I think that because in chapter 9, the disciples as a group are recorded as having a discussion as to which of them were the greatest. And then there in chapter 9, as he does here in the verses that follow, Jesus addresses this issue with all of them. He doesn't just address it with James and John. It's often the case, isn't it, that our strong reactions are a giveaway as to what it is we hold close to our heart. And I think that's what's happening here. These disciples, like us, they want to be powerful. They want to find glory. Just last week, I was having lunch with the extended family and we were talking about postgraduate education. And the mere fact that we were talking about that shows us uh, what a privileged position we occupy, that we can talk about this as a real option for us. And in the conversation, I admitted that even though I have a master's degree, I would much rather a PhD. Now, the thought of doing all that work for a PhD actually makes me feel a little bit sick. But I said I'd love to have a PhD because I'd love to be called doctor. I'd love to have that title. Now, my sister-in-law said at this point, quite rightly, she said, but you already have a title. You're the Reverend Martin Kemp. And I said, yes, but the Reverend Dr. Martin Kemp would just sound so much more magnificent. That's the way it is with human nature, isn't it? The hunt for glory, the desire to be a cut above the rest, to have a lofty title. As the teacher in Ecclesiastes says in the Old Testament, I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. But it's not the way for those who would follow Christ. Come now to our third home truth, and that is that Jesus flips our understanding of glory upside down. If the first home truth is for us to realise the path that Jesus walked was a path of humble service, and if the second home truth is to realise that the human heart really does desire for glory, then the first home, third home truth is for us to realise that, well, the proper path of glory is to follow the path of Jesus, to follow this path of, of humble service. That's what glory really is like in, in God's way of, of looking at things. Uh, verse 42, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. You know, we're used to thinking of our elected leaders as public servants. We use that word, don't we? Public servants. Um, rulers in Jesus' day thought they were something special. They thought they were in a class which was genuinely a cut above everyone else. Uh, emperors of Rome were semi-divine figures. Uh, you can imagine the various abuses of, of power that, that would come with, with such a self-assessment. If you think you're, you're of the gods, then you're probably going to take advantage of a few people. Although in Jesus' time, uh, such actions probably weren't viewed as being abusive. They were just viewed as being a normal part of leadership. But Jesus requires a very different approach from us. Verse 43. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. This, according to Jesus, is what true greatness looks like. Becoming a servant and slave of others. And not a servant like many of our own political figures end up being. People who use the office of servanthood as a means to further their, their own plans. But a servant who is genuinely all about others. In the same way that a slave's role was to serve another person's household, so too our role is to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a great story about the founder of the Salvation Army. General William Booth. The story goes that towards the end of his, his years, 
he was due to speak at the North American Convention for the Salvation Army. All the Salvation Army officers in Canada and the United States were gathered together to hear the last great charge from the founder of their movement, General William Booth. But as the time drew near, General Booth was too frail to make the journey and too frail to give the address, but he sent a telegram instead. And as the convention chairman stood up there on the platform, telegram in hand, he opened it up and discovered that the message just consisted of one word, others, others. It's a great summary, a great one word summary, one word sermon of the teachings that we have here in this passage in Mark chapter 10. If there was a summary of your own life, uh, what word would that be? Me or others? Famous or invisible? Winner or servant? All this doesn't mean that leadership and, and power are off limits to the Christian, um, but it does mean that we won't seek out these honours for our own satisfaction, but rather we'll only seek them out if there's a need for others to be served in that way. And it certainly shapes the way we use these privileges. There are plenty of stories where those who have power invested in them run over those they are leading because they're actually being driven by what it is they want to achieve rather than what is good for the people who are entrusted to them. But when service becomes the driver, then we're using power in a Christ-like way. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, Jesus concludes, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so as we end this passage, we come once more to the cross. The cross as the model for all that we do. Christ's death was a ransom. A payment releasing people who'd been imprisoned by their sin. A payment, a costly payment, on our behalf. An act of service. You know, when Donald Trump was campaigning before the last presidential election... Uh, he was found to say that his favourite book was the Bible. His second favourite book, of course, was the book with his own name on the cover, The Art of the Deal. But he did say that his favourite book was the Bible. Frankly, it's a difficult claim to believe. Because when you open the pages of the Bible, you see pretty much on every page the command for those who would follow God to be humble servants self-effacing servants, sacrificial servants. But we too say we love the Bible, don't we? We say we love the Bible, and so what about us? Have we embraced this idea of a cross-shaped, sacrificial life? Or like James and John, are we enamoured with the idea of grabbing glory for ourselves? Maybe now is a good time to come before God with a prayer of confession. confession. Confessing those times when we've arrogantly grabbed fame for ourselves, seeking his forgiveness, then asking the Holy Spirit to help us live differently. It's a good time to confess our sin.